human spirit from the time that it's conceived, it, it has a repugnance to death. There's something about it that rebels against death. I think most people are afraid of the unknown and uh, death is a great unknown. Are you comfortable with the thought of your own death? Even though everyone dies, death is one of those topics most people would rather not discuss. And that's too bad, because facing the reality of death can actually make our lives more joyful. Jesus said he came to give life and to give it in abundance. Can we really get beyond the fear of death? Prepare to be inspired as we hear some special people who, like each one of us, are facing death. Philip Deming is a Lutheran deacon and a resident chaplain at Sharp Grossmont Hospital in San Diego. I don't think as a culture we deal with death very well. We are a youth-oriented culture. Not only do we not deal with death very well, we don't deal with aging very well. Um, there's an honoring of aging, I think, that has historically been part of many cultures that we don't have. Um, we live in a denial of death. We live in a denial of aging. We don't talk about death. Um, I'm careful when I talk with patients who are dealing with death to use the word death because we don't talk about death. We talk about passing on or we, we have euphemisms for what is a natural part of who we are and what's going to happen with all of us. For Dr. George Farrell is a renowned Christian died. theologian. A thousand years ago, 100% of all people died. A hundred years ago, 100% of all people died. Believe it or not, still 100% of all people die. So what's a big deal? I don't think denying death is particularly helpful. It's so much part of life that we ought to uh, come to terms with it. And the sooner we do, the better for us. I, I think it's, it's, it's something, it's sort of sad if you have to live your life denying one of the great realities of life. H.R. Bowman is a Navy surgeon who's witnessed death in war as well as in peaceful hospital settings. From purely a medical standpoint, when a patient dies, it is basically failure of the organism. And we sign off the death certificate stating the causes of death. And from a medical standpoint, that's the end. From a personal standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint, no, I don't believe that that is the end. Um, I have spent too many years learning and training to take care of this human organism. And every time that I operate on somebody, that I open the abdomen or part of the body to do even simple things or major things, I am just overwhelmed with, despite how different all people are, how inside they are so much the same and that how magnificent this organism is. This didn't come about by chance. There's no way that came about by chance. And therefore, you know, there must be a supreme being creator that has devised us as humans, or developed us as humans. Sister Lourdes is with the Missionaries of Charity Contemplative, an order begun by Mother Teresa. Part of her mission includes ministering to the sick and dying. We love you. I think in, in every human spirit, from the time that it's conceived, it, it has a repugnance to death. There's something about it that rebels against death. And I think that's that, it's so universal, that even if one had no religious background, to me, it would speak of a life after death. Otherwise, we would say, oh, we came to the end of the road. Hooray, I can, you know, sleep for all eternity, you know. But no, we rebel against. There's something within us that if we haven't totally betrayed who we are or, or what we're about, we rebel against the, the thought of, of just being annihilated forever and always. This disease is a disease that has to be prayed for because it's not stopping. It's growing. Yeah. You know, Are you in pain, Patrick? I'm in terrible pain all the time. I have neuropathy. The skin, the muscles adhere to the bone. As you get closer in the process to, yes, obviously death is imminent. Uh, it is very important 
that the psychological and spiritual needs yeah. as well yeah. as the, the physical needs of the patient becomes yeah. very important. Yeah. What their own beliefs are, are important. Now and we strongly suggest that patients uh, who have a, have a strong belief need to really make peace with their, with their God. So maybe 10 o'clock tomorrow morning? Florence McCarthy is administrator of Edgemore Geriatric Hospital, run by the county of San Diego. The hospital serves not only the elderly, but indigent patients of all ages with diseases like AIDS or severe brain injury. Everybody knows that we're known as the facility of last resort, and so, you know, that's a terrible name to have, and you can imagine the, the, the patients that are admitted here, they're rejected 250 times, and then they're <laughs> admitted to a place that has that reputation. But I almost think that maybe we should change it, uh, if we could anyway, and it should be the facility of eternal hope. In my 20 years as an administrator, I've never met anyone that did not want to talk about God, especially if they were terminally ill. They seek it, they want it, and that's our responsibility as human beings to make sure that they get there so that death is not scary. Most of the time uh, when they reach that point, uh, they start talking more and more about God and what's going to happen. And some of them will uh, ask to have their ministers come in and perhaps baptize them or reaffirm what they believe. Sometimes the rabbi comes in and reaffirms with them. And sometimes there are conversions here. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. We have one uh, patient who was just baptized about two weeks ago. And he had a lot of fear about dying because he kept seeing all his friends and, and some family members die. And he's the only one left of this whole group. And now, uh, since his baptism, you can almost see a certain amount of not just joy, but, but peace. He's, he's at peace with it, and, and he's ready if, when God calls him. My life has changed, sister, since I've been baptized, and I'm doing what God wants, and that's serving his people. Yeah. And by serving his people, by being a missionary, by going out like you do and talking to the people. He's been with each one who's died. He's, he saw them through. He's had been a tremendous witness and of compassion and, and outreach to the other patients, too. It really uh, helps a lot if they're surrounded with, with people that believe and can help them through that, that period. I see them and I see them die. When I do, the parting hurts, but I know that they are going to my Heavenly Father in Heaven, and I know there they will have paradise. And so, I have no fear for them. I don't fear dying myself. When it happens, it happens. It becomes personally very difficult to face the patients and the family and because we feel as if we're failing. But this patient was um, such a, taught me a lesson in that after she finally had developed one of her major complications and she was going back in the respiratory failure. We were going to have to put her back on the ventilator. And I went to talk to her about what was going on and, and where we were. She sat me down then said, just sit here with me. And she looked at me and she said, to remember, she says, death is not the enemy. It's our broken relationships and our inhumanity to each other that is. Just don't leave me.
I've worked as a hospice chaplain. I've worked as an emergency room chaplain. I've worked as a general chaplain for the hospital. I've worked for a little while at Children's Hospital uh, and as a, have experienced death and childbirth, death, uh, people in their 30s and 40s through AIDS, through cancer, uh, traumatic accidents, uh, people who have extubated or removed life support from people involved in, in traumatic accidents. Um, Part of it is just being able to come to that recognition of pain with a hope that goes beyond the pain. And I don't want to be trite, but I need to come to that with a belief that beyond this pain, God has something for us in love that makes this pain worthwhile. For Christians, of course, death has taken a different, uh, it has changed with the resurrection of Christ. because. He is, as the Bible again says, the down payment, the first fruit. This is, gives us some idea of what uh, eternal life is like. And so uh, in death, we also are rem always reminded of our uh, confrontation with Christ, our, that Christ is with us. The cross is what gives meaning to life, and most people don't understand that, so they run away from the cross or they don't recognize that this particular thing in their lives is the cross. Jesus is coming to them in a special way if they only could wake up to it. And I myself stumble across the cross <laughs> in my life too. Jesus said, I came to give life and give it in abundance. And we think giving life in abundance is reaching out and grabbing for things, but it's not, it's within, it's within. I would say that Christ who, when he confronted the death of Lazarus, Say, uh, react to the death of Lazarus, not like some pious Christians do. Well, don't worry about it, he's in heaven. He said, he wept. That was his response. And he wept not because of Lazarus, but because of the sadness of these two women, the, the sisters of Lazarus, whom he also loved. And he saw how pained they were. And I think it is part of Christian uh, compassion to weep with people that weep. I don't think it is a particularly Christian thing to come with easy answers to people who are suffering and uh, have us terribly sad. And the, mo the most appropriate thing to do is to be sad with them and then also rejoice with them when they get over it. But uh, weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. That's the Apostle Paul. So, so y we, we have a way of of dealing with this if God gives us the grace. If it hurt for Jesus, it's okay for it to hurt for us. And God doesn't back away. I can even be angry with God because of a death, and God doesn't back away. God honors the emotions that he's given to us to feel the grieving process and be there, to have it be stunned and shocked, to have it be sorrowful, to have it be angry. Those are okay. When you know that God is love and you have a real deep conviction of that, then whatever happens, there's no despair in it. There's no um, darkness in it. There's no running away from it. God has allowed this. I don't know why. It's very painful. It hurts like anything. Feel the pain. Just stay with the pain. Because in staying with the pain, the Holy Spirit can relieve the pain. But if we run away from it, he can't help us. We put ourselves outside. We're taking control then and we're not letting God be God. If we throw away the suffering, we become empty and joyless. If you see a person that can't deal with suffering on any level, was running away from, from that suffering, there's no joy in their life. It's empty, it's futile, there's despair, there's depression, there's, there's drivenness. Um, but when the suffering is recognized for what it is and embraced, it becomes lighter, it, it becomes less. Uh, and then real joy, real love happens. You know, a real connectedness happens. You know, that feeling of disconnection, especially in our day and age, is so great. And it's, it's precisely that, not embracing the suffering part. The Christian hope is based on, on their relationship to God and Jesus Christ. And Christian people believe that uh, they will spend, spend uh, life in community with Christ and that death does not separate them. I mean, the Apostle Paul says this in so many words, that neither death nor life, nor principality, nor powers, nor things present nor things to come can separate us 
from the love of God in Jesus Christ. And this, this is, of course, what makes Christianity so much fun, that you don't have this sense that, that uh, you only go around once or drink all the beer you can. The, 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 this, this, is, this is not, not our way of seeing it, that, that we could just go around once. We see it as, as going around forever with Christ as our companion. Deathbed conversion is an awful lot better than no conversion at all. And on top of that, I don't know what God works in a silent person. And I don't know what the person has already communed with God silently and in their heart. I always presume that God's made room for someone to be converted. Um, the most painful times sometimes for believers are those that have had someone that has died that they don't know has been converted. I guess the most powerful hope that I can give is that I don't need to hear the conversion to believe or to know that it could be happening. Don't, don't try to move your head, okay? All right. Why don't you give me your name again? I do not believe that you can plan deathbed conversion. For one thing, you don't ever know when you get hit by the truck and that you never know how this is going to end. So I, I would uh, strongly advise against deathbed conversions and uh, suggest that you get yourself in uh, touch with God earlier, uh, as soon as possible, today. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I think that uh, the, uh, it's per perfectly valid to have a deathbed conversion if you are granted one. Often, the understanding of someone's death stops life, moves us out of the, the, the deadening pace of how life goes for us and forces us to look at the fact that we're going to die too. Life is finite and we are very fragile creatures. Uh, God's made us wonderfully but also fragilely. Often for someone who has been alienated from family because of lifestyle choices or because of family squabbles or because of even brokenness within the family. Um, healing can occur between someone who is dying and people they love or even after death between people who are now for the first time perhaps in decades getting together to do something which is to grieve someone they loved to reflect on how is life now going to be without this person in all of their lives. I think for those who are facing death, as we all must do, and I think as I look back and remember what I had to go through this last year when my father died, that when it strikes that close to you that the only way to survive it is to understand that while the body and the organism, the human organism, may stop functioning, there is a presence, an essence uh, that is beyond that we exist in and that uh, there is a God who cares for us, loves us, and that when we die, we don't really die. We are just now in God's presence. There is not only a God, but I know that Jesus died and he rose from the dead, and that is my hope. And that's my faith, and that's what makes me go on here every day. I used to fear death, and I don't fear death anymore. I don't run forward to it to embrace it, but I don't fear it. And one of the gifts that people who die have given to me is a better appreciation of what God's given to us as we're here and as we live. And a reminder that there still is life after this life. Some people just can't accept that God did all that for them, when they, especially toward the end of their life when they're coming to death. With, they look back on their lives and the mistakes they've made, or, or, and, and they just can't believe God could be so loving, and yet in their hearts are telling them it's true. And so 
how can they hope in it? But yet they hope. They hope anyway. You know, it's so beautiful to see. And we always encourage them to really trust the mercy of God. And they're a witness, a real witness to it, because they're a living reality of it happening. I am awed and honored sometimes by their deep trust, the gift that they give to me and their hope and their faith. How do I have hope sometimes? It's because the person who's dying looks me in the eyes and smiles and lets me feel their hope and their trust and their experience of the love of God as they're dying. And that's powerful. I don't always give people something, but whenever I'm a chaplain, they always give me something. Are you praying for you? Okay. God bless, God bless you. you. I would say pray, because through prayer, then we're led to where we need to go to, um, to live a full life. And those that are dying are not necessarily not living a full life. Most of them are living much more fuller lives than you and I are, because they're in touch with the reality so clearly and their days are full of the spirit you know love the lord your god with all your heart with all your might with all your soul and your neighbor as yourself and it's pretty simple it's hard to do but it's pretty simple to remember and when you can give the weight of who we are away to god um, the fear can go away too In the days before my brother Terry died in a swim accident at a friend's pool, my whole family had been working together to dig a hole in the backyard to prepare for our own above ground pool. On the day that Terry died, that new pool was delivered and my parents sent it back. My dad every day would go out into the backyard and he'd look at that hole in the ground and then he started to plant flowers in that hole and he'd go every day before work and after work and tend to those flowers. And I thought that hole in the ground represented a hole in his faith and emptiness in his life. Years later, my Uncle Roger told me what that hole in the backyard really meant. On the day of my brother's funeral, my dad took his own brother Roger into the backyard and they stood around that hole in the ground and he explained to him that every day he would plant flowers in this hole to represent the new life that comes in Jesus Christ and that this hole wasn't empty but filled with the life of Jesus and the new life of his son Terry. It was such a powerful witness to my Uncle Roger. The whole family went home and joined a church and became Christians and it's still a powerful witness to me today about death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Death is a dark mystery we may never fully comprehend, but we need not despair. There is hope. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die.